Well, this is looking more and more and more and more like it. Amen? We're, you're just coming in and doing church, living life. Hallelujah. Whatever's happening, it isn't taking the Lord by surprise. As I waited before the Lord uh, last Sunday afternoon, I no sooner knelt before the Lord, looked up to the heavens and said, Now what? And the Lord spoke, um, Possessors are on time. Amen. Possessors are on time. And it's just really awesome because we just did uh, the end and now we're on, oh, on time. We're on time. And so God confirms what I'm going to be talking to you about today is the Kairos time of God. What is the Kairos time? I believe we are in a Kairos moment uh, universally right now. And that is really exciting. Um, what is a Kairos time? Kairos uh, literally means coming to a head. When things and circumstances come to a head, it is, uh, the definition is uh, God's dimension of time. It's not chronological time. Uh, it is a God kind of time, God's, um, God's measurement of time. It is an opportune time, a fitting time, a season, a certain season is a kairos time. Uh, those seasons are often in fulfillment to divine promises, are often lining up with the Jewish feast days, as we will look into God's word and see. Things coming to a head, uh, even politically and every, everything we can anticipate when things starting to come to a head. And it's often a time of great favor, um, and it often highlights the attributes of the Lord. So very often when there was a, um, something new that the Lord wanted to reveal to his people, like Jehovah Jireh, uh, the names of God, it would be in fulfillment. God was doing something very fitting, something very specific at a certain time. Those are definitions of a Kairos time. It's not chronological time broken into seconds and, and minutes and hours and days. Uh, but the Lord, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Um, and we're going to be looking at the examples biblically of uh, the Kairos moments and also um, examples of of Cairo-specific Cairo God-appointed times. Um, I want to just start with reading the word, Luke 1, 5 to 23. And so you can listen for those words of time, when it's time. Uh, just really beautiful, too, just how the Lord, uh, on a large scale, uh, globally, God is doing something very Kairos. Uh, but in I believe God is doing a lot of Kairos moments, a fitting time of renewing individuals' lives as well. There's going to be new things. The old way is gone, and there's new things coming. So if God's doing something, uh, sometimes when things look the darkest, they look the darkest before dawn, um, it just rest assured that the Lord is doing something very special and uh, those Kairos moments, those uh, fitting time, season of, of he's getting ready to move supernaturally in your individual lives as well. So it, let's go to the word. In the time, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by law, according to the custom and priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time... For burning incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right hand of the altar. He was startled, and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. 
He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn hearts of the parents to their children and disobedient to the wisdom of righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife, uh, notice he doesn't say she's old, he's smart, and, and, he, and my wife, well, she's getting along in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I've seen, been sent to speak to you, to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and unable to speak until the day it happens, because you did not believe my my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So these words is Kairos, a Kairos time, a God time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed out for so long. And when he came out, he could not speak. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but he remained unable to speak. And when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, in this Kairos time, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace from the people. So many wonderful keys here that you'll be able to uh, refer back to. I just want to go through a little bit of um, biblical history just to remind you of times when things literally came to a head. Uh, we've been around, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, history tends to repeat itself and if you read the Old Testament you'll see things go in cycles. They uh, degrade, they get worse and worse and worse to such a degree that things come to a head and the Lord is always wanting to renew, refresh, do a new thing and so at his fitting time at these God appointed times he comes again to do a new thing to bring people back uh, to the place where they need to be to shift them so to speak so you'll remember the story of Noah there was great wickedness and wickedness abounded and God said I'm, I'm sorry that I even made mankind uh, and so he, he was going to destroy the world with a flood and so he told Noah to build an ark and uh, that was a Kairos uh, moment. Wickedness came to such a head. And then we see again with Moses, God's people were f for 400 years in bondage. And um, wickedness had increased to such a degree that people couldn't stand it any longer. And God heard from heaven, heard the groaning, heard the crying. And meanwhile, at God's appointed Kairos time, he had raised up Moses. Uh, and you'll remember that um, they had told all the, to throw all the babies uh, in the Nile River. And then yet again, God's people are, are in the wilderness, and they're in the wilderness for 40 years and before their uh, deliverance. Things came to a head, and then God was able to move them supernaturally at this Kairos moment out of bondage and a through uh, many miraculous signs and wonders into the promised land. And we'll go through some of the more details as we go through this again with different points. And then we see again Sodom and Gomorrah with great uh, wickedness had come to the Lord and it reached the Lord's ears. Things had come to a head as far as wickedness. And again, God is um, moves in a powerful way of destruction and renewal and saving people out of that situation. And then we see again with Nehemiah, uh, they were 120 years, uh, they, all the walls were broken down and uh, they were burnt with fire and pe his people were in a bad way. And God raised up Nehemiah who starts to pray and petition and go before the king. And then in 52 days, he, he He's got all the walls rebuilt again. And then we see through the judges, Gideon, who God raised up um, 
after seven years of being oppressed by the Midianites, uh, God raises up Gideon, and then with two, 300 men, uh, they have their torches and their lanterns and blow their trumpets, and God brings a supernatural victory once again. Um, the Lord caused uh, the enemy to turn against one another. And then we see Samson, the people God was, uh, God's people were oppressed by the Philistines for years and years, and God raises up Samson uh, to be their deliverer and gives them supernatural strength, supernatural favor. Um, and then Deborah as well, we all know the story of Deborah, where God raised up a woman to, to be a warrior and to save God's people. And then Hebrews 11 uh, is full of one testimony after another, after another, after another, and it says time doesn't permit to go through every story in detail, but I wanted to give you an overview so that you could understand how God is constantly, constantly moving, and when things get bad, and they go from bad to worse, and reach a crisis situation, and they all come to a head, uh, we can anticipate that God is ready to move once again, and his God appoints times. And I believe God is saying by his spirit, we are uh, in the midst of the building up. Things are coming to a head for God to move supernaturally once again. Amen. So that was uh, our introduction. Uh, whew, that was fun. That was fun just looking. I, I just thinking, oh God, it's hard not to get stuck on any one of those incredible stories to tell the miracles and the, the uh, God coincidences, the God incidences of, of that are happening. But what God wants us to know is things that mark a Kairos moment. And again, this is so exciting because on Tuesday morning as we were interceding, I kept getting the word accelerator. God wants to add uh, something to accelerate all of this. And uh, you'll know that God's Kairos time is not limited to our chronological time frame, the way we think of time. God can accelerate. He can cause a chemical, like a chemical reaction is, is what I was sensing in the spirit. You can cause a chemistry. You can put something in, in your chemistry to cause an acceleration, that process to uh, supernaturally increase. And again, I feel like that is what God is doing. We were looking at prophecy, end time prophecy in the book of Revelations, and for a long time, we wondered how are all these things going to come together and culminate uh, so quickly. Nobody would have anticipated with this uh, situation with COVID and everything that so many prophecies are coming to a head. And um, so it, that is an example of acceleration. God can make things speed up. And another example of that is he says in the book of Revelations, um, if the Lord had not shortened those days, nobody would have been able to live. And so God can shorten things, uh, and he can lengthen things, and he can be God. In this Kairos moment, we must not think of God being limited. He can accelerate things. And so one of the, the um, markings of a Kairos moment when things come to a head is there becomes an acceleration of circumstances and and God bringing things together. Uh, you may have uh, experienced even in your own personal life how the Lord, he says he directs our steps where you think, wow, that was a coincidence. I just happened to run into that person or whatever. But the Lord is able to intercept bring together our day-to-day -day lives with his Kairos moments. And, the, and God wants us to be aware of that, to be looking for that, because there's going to be an acceleration uh, very quickly. And I believe even as we get raptured, the church gets raptured, which I believe he's preparing us very much for, um, there will be a, 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 once the church of Jesus Christ is gone, it's not going to take a whole lot for wickedness to abound. Amen. The Lord will be wrapping things up pretty quick. And so there's an acceleration in the spirit. Um, suddenly, there's a suddenly, um, even with uh, acceleration with Nehemiah for, for, for 150, 
is it 150 days uh, the walls were broken down with, and burnt with fire. And at God's Kairos moment, he raises up Nehemiah. He intercepts him. Nehemiah is serving the king, and he's bringing him his cup. Someone comes and tells Nehemiah that the walls are broken down, burnt with fire. And, and he, he gets the burden of the Lord, and he, and he begins to weep, and he begins to intercede and, and repent for his nation. And then God moves upon him to speak to the king, and the king says, why are you so sad? And he says, well, uh, the, the place where my father's worship is burnt with fire. And so the king asked, what can I do for you? And just to prove this point, the Lord moves about circumstances very quickly. Nehemiah goes, inspects the walls, etc., makes a plan. And within 52 days, 52 days, God accelerates and the walls are restored. So that's how quickly God can bring a restoration. When it's God's timing, it's God's timing. And there'll be an acceleration of circumstances. Amen. Hallelujah. He can do things quickly. Amen. So we need to be well aware of God's timing. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Because we're not aware of God's timing. Amen. And uh, again, within a few circumstances in our own personal life, uh, today, ju just um, this week, I was making, um, I had made uh, one of our favorite suppers, meatloaf and scalp potatoes and squash, one of these oven suppers, and I had accidentally taken out my shepherd's pie, and it was like, oh dear. Long story short, that meatloaf didn't quite get in the oven on time, and when I cut into it, it wasn't quite done yet. So let's go for a walk around the pond, and when we come back, that thing was ready. Uh, but there needs to be, uh, you know, keep that in the oven. It would be gross, right? Downright gross when I cut into it and it wasn't ready yet. You want it to be ready. You want it. God's timing is his timing. And he knows he, we're the clay. He's the potter. He's doing something. And we can rush that process and say, you know, if we went to Lydia's pottery shop and said, it's good enough. I like it. Just give me that. Thing. I need it for a Christmas present, but you, there's this process that it needs to go through before it's this uh, beautiful glazed pottery vessel that's ready to be drink. You can put your hot coffee and you can put it in the microwave and it can withstand whatever it is created to do. And so we need to trust the Lord. Amen. Uh, you'll remember my little testimony of when I turned 50 and sat before the Lord and the Lord said, so what did you learn in the last 10 years, I believe he said. And I said, ah, uh, that your timing's your timing. And then he said, so what are you going to do in the next leg of the journey? I said, ah, uh, I think I'll just enjoy the journey instead of being anxious about it. Because, you know, we can, uh, we can just, have you noticed that when the Lord's not going to do something and he's ta we're talking about something. God, I'm talking to you about something. I'll never forget the day I knelt before the Lord. I need to hear from heaven today about this vision. I need to know what to do. And he says, worship me. I'm going, God, you're so frustrating. I don't want to worship you. I want you to talk to me and tell me what to do, what to do, what to do. We, know, we want to know, what do I do? And he's got his timing, amen? And, and then all of a sudden we realize, hey, we've gotten old. Did we forget to enjoy the journey or were we anxious about things? And so we're not to be anxious because God's timing is his timing and he can speed things up and he can slow things down. And he can intercept our time. He is Lord. If we're constantly... Uh, acknowledging God in all of our ways, then we can be assured that his ways and his timing and, and he will fulfill all of his promises. He is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. Amen. Keep us in that oven until we're good and done. Then we're going to be ready. And second marking of a Kairos time is unusual occurrences or supernatural uh, occurrences. Very often when things come to a head, God's on the scene, he's fighting our battles, and he does unusual things. Often signs and wonders in the heavens, often angelic visitations. Uh, here Zachariah is doing his regular priestly duty, and an angel appears before him. 
unusual occurrences or where the Lord gives supernatural dreams. Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. You see um, God speaking to people, calling them into, uh, into um, in specific callings. Uh, when things happen that never happen or hardly ever happened. Uh, this is so thrilling even now with um, Jupiter and uh, Saturn coming together, it is creating a Christmas star. This has not happened in 800 years. 800 years. And what is the number eight symbolized? New beginnings. And God says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth proclaims the work of their hands. The stars proclaim his work day after day. They utter their speech. Amen. And so even the heavens, so these are unusual occurrences right at the right time, at God's Kairos time. Could it be that the Christmas star signaling Jesus' coming, first coming, is signaling, get ready, church. You got a little warning. You got a little heads up. Things are coming to a head. Get ready. Or is the world going to miss it? Is the world going to miss it and say, well, that was a kind of an unusual bright star. Amen? And so unusual occurrences, things coming to a head, Mary gets pregnant supernaturally. Unusual, things that usually don't ever happen. Zachariah and Elizabeth, when they're well past age of bearing, unusual occurrences, supernatural happenings, so that all people will go, God is up to something. Something unusual, something supernatural is on the horizon. And we see how God raised up David and Jonathan. These two young bucks, they decide one day, we're tired of those Philistines taunting us and saying, hey, why don't you come up here and fight? Give us a man to fight us. And so David and Jonathan decide. They decide if they're, hey, how about if they say, hey, next time they come out, they say, Hey, come on up here, guys, and we'll fight you. Then we'll know God gives them to us. But if they say, hey, we're going to come down and have you for lunch. If they say, we're coming down, let's run because God isn't giving us. On that, it was their big, bright idea. So two boys take out the whole army. The whole army, the whole Israelite army, what they couldn't do, these two do. Supernaturally. When God fights for his people, it is a supernatural uh, occurrence. I want to take, this is where I just happened to read this morning. Hezekiah um, is, Sennacherib is threatening Jerusalem. And um, Hezekiah uh, begins to pray to the Lord. Sennacherib mocks them very often. As we'll look at later, the enemy uh, uses this time. He, he just gives it all he's got. Um, but the long story short, Hezekiah and the people of Israel cry out to the Lord. Verse 20 of 2 Chronicles 32, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah cried out in prayer to heaven about this, and the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and the officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace, and when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons of his own flesh and blood cut him down with a sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib and from the hand of all the others. He took care of, of them on every side. Amen. So again, supernatural intervention, unusual occurrences, something that never happens. Amen. And we can look for these things to happen uh, and expect the Lord to do these unusual things once again. I believe that is why, this, why the stars just happens to show up uh, 800 years later. Um, amazing. There was another supernatural something with the numbers. Oh, yes. The word kairos, timing, was, is in the Bible 86 times. And I just thought, okay, the Lord's been doing this thing with numbers lately that we, again, we need to 
pay close attention to because very often it's Kairos time. Uh, there'll be the uh, number three or the number 12 or the number eight new beginnings. And 86 is new beginnings for man. And just so I see, new beginnings, when God does his Kairos moments, these, these acts of supernatural deliverance, on God's exact timetable, very often the numbers will confirm uh, what he's doing. There's, again, signs and times and seasons that are fitting seasons. Amen. An example of that, um, I didn't know where exactly this was going to come in, but it's a good time. Just all the Passover, all the feast days of the Lord are, are examples. I won't be able to go into great detail. But on Passover, God's people celebrated the Passover lamb, put the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorpost for generations and generations. And then on Passover, uh, Jesus Christ is born at that exact time. Amen. And then at the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was often hidden in a napkin, uh, they hide Jesus' body. Jesus was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then Jesus rises from the dead on the first fruit day, another, the third festival. He rises and he says that we too will be uh, after born, like uh, resurrect. Uh, our bodies will be resurrected. If he's the first fruits, uh, he's the firstborn of many brethren. He was the firstborn to rise from the dead. And then the fourth feast of of the season, of spring seasons, is a feast of weeks. And that's 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the church is born in its Pentecost. It happens to fall right on the feast day, the Pentecost. And so you see these exact feast days, the Lord fulfilling all of his promises. He is on track. Isn't that wonderful? And then now looking forward, there's a, another few feast days that we haven't yet experienced, but what can we look forward to is the next one for the fall feast is the Feast of Trumpets. That's when we get raptured. Amen. And it's getting close. It's getting close. You have to be deaf and blind in the spirit to not sense things are coming to a head. Amen. Amen. So the fall feast, the feast of trumpets, when we get raptured, you better be ready. You better have your oil lamps filled up. You better go to the Holy Ghost and get filled with oil because 50% of the church is not going to be ready, not going to be ready. They're going to be the foolish virgins, and they're going to be falling asleep and doing their own thing. And they're going to miss it. Five wise, five foolish Half of the church body will be missing it. The next is the Day of Atonement. And that's when all the people that are left, the Jewish nation, is going to come to repentance on the Day of Atonement. That is as soon as we get raptured, they'll realize they missed it. And they have, they'll put two and two together that Jesus was the Messiah. Amen. And then we get the Feast of Tabernacles when, the Holy, when Jesus comes and sets his foot on the planet and rules and reigns and comes and dwells among us forever. And we will be forever with the Lord. Amen. So there's an example. Those are some already examples of uh, that Kairos timing, the exact timing, the fitting season of the Lord. The third marking of the Kairos time is, is the enemy pulls out all stops. So we see this demonic, the enemy, the Bible says he knows his time is short. So he is just, uh, he is doing all that he knows to do to deceive the nations. That's who he is. He's a liar. And so you need to know what to look for. The Bible says we're not unaware of his tactics. Well, if we know he's a liar, uh, then we need to be seeking truth. We need to be going to the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit, is this the truth? Is this really what's going on? Or is there something more sinister going on here? And, it, 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 you know, everything they used to call conspiracy theory is now out there in the open on Times Magazine and everywhere else is on Fox News is, is just happening. 
before our eyes. And in the Bible times, the enemy was always seeming to anticipate. He doesn't, he's not all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present. But he somehow anticipates when, some, when things are coming to a head. Amen? And so when, when Moses, God was about to move in a powerful way to lead his people out of bondage, uh, all the baby boys are, are, are commanded, the parents, the midwives, to throw all these babies in the Nile River. But Moses' parents saw that he was a beautiful child knew that there was an anointing on him and they hid him. You know the rest of the story. But again, at the birth of Jesus, Herod sends out a decree to kill all the baby boys that are two and under. Again, we see the same occurrence. The enemy just replays his hand again. The abortions that are happening uh, right now is the enemy knows his time is short. So it's like kill. He hates people. How many can he take down? Amen. Again, when we see the rebuilding of the walls, Sinbalat rises up and taunts the people, speaks in their own Hebrew language, saying, who are you trying to build these feeble Christians, trying to rebuild the walls? And, and he makes you feel insignificant. And we're just uh, so outnumbered. And, and, and uh, you know, the church is so we we tend to fall for the tricks of the enemy. Uh, but God can do supernatural things by many or by few. Amen. Even with Gideon, God says, sorry, you got too many men. You still got too many men. So it's, he reduced it down to 300 so that they wouldn't say, we have won the victory. God wants to get the glory. He will get the glory as we sang this morning. And the same um, with Daniel. The enemy did not much like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, his, his, the three guys. And so they wouldn't bow their knee. And so the enemy, you know, and I believe he's going to be doing that again very soon. One world religion. It's all the same, ladies and gentlemen. Whether you call your God this, Allah, or whether you call him Buddha, uh, you know, we're all, we're all uh, God's children. And he's going to be doing it again. And he did it in Daniel's day. And they set up a great big statue, a great big idol. And they said, everybody's going to bow down to this God at the sound of the music. And they refused to bow down. And so the enemy sets the stage because he knows his time is short. And it's going to be the same in the end times. The enemy giving it every and pulling out all stops. Amen. And uh, there's never been so many scandals and lies and division and chaos. Uh, but God always comes to the rescue in the chaos. So that is, is another thing that we can look for during a Kairos time as the enemy pulls out all stops. And now in conclusion, what about today? What about now? What about us? Amen. And so I want to close just with... Um, Several scriptures here. Second Corinthians 6, 2 says, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you. In the day of my salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the Kairos time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. There was another uh, reality of the Kairos marking Kairos time was the fact that God's incredible favor is on people to do the supernatural. He calls ordinary men and women to turn the world upside down. And there'll be an incredible favor upon us, incredible grace. So what do we mean? I always want to redefine grace. Grace is God's enablement, his divine favor. God's ability, God's riches at Christ's expense. Those are weapons the Holy Spirit gives us. He gave Samson his weapon and David his weapon. And each one of the, these special men or women that God called, he equipped them. And God is going to equip us. And he's looking for who's going to stand in the gap. Who will pray? Who will fight? Who will confront the powers of darkness? And I believe this is a day where God is saying, we need to be like Isaiah. Here am I, send me. 
something needs to be done, oh Lord. And we begin to pray, and that's when the Lord says, fear not, for I've called you. And he's saying that to you today. Fear not, for I've called you to special purposes. Amen? Might be dance during praise and worship, where you can rout the powers of the enemy. Don't underestimate what God can do through simple acts of obedience. To sing a song at the right time. To dance a little dance. To speak a word. To say the prayer and say, I'm coming in agreement with all of creation today. There are billions and maybe millions of Christians praying every day. Praying for God's answer. Praying that he will come quickly, praying, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on the earth, praying, Lord of the harvest, send us forth, amen? And so now we need to receive the favor and the gifts and the equipment of God to do the supernatural. And he always used the one least expected. As you can, I could go through the whole list again, but we won't. Moses stuttered. What a guy to call to talk to the people. Ah, God, what is this? David wasn't even bothered. Don't even bother calling them in when, when it's time to anoint somebody. Too young, too little. Mm. And so God will use the, use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, to do the supernatural. It's like, huh? Disciples? Fishermen? You're going to pick fishermen? Why didn't you go through the ranks of all these priests that were trained uh, in the school of Gamaliel that at least know the word of God? These fishermen, what do they know? They smell. They stink. What are we doing here? Amen? Oh, let's send the fishermen. Let's send the fishermen to the religious and let, let's send the one who is schooled in Gamaliel. Let's send him to the ones that don't know anything about anything. That's what the Lord does. He likes to mess it up so that we can't say, it's because I am so strong and I am so smart. And I, it's like God might speak and say, go and call that politician. It might be the thing that just changes everything. What is the one word that can change a whole situation, accelerate the whole situation, cause God to, to do something supernatural. There will be signs and wonders following those who believe. And God says, don't receive the grace, don't receive that divine equipment in vain for nothing. It's to do something with it. Amen. And Galatians 6 says, and don't get weary in doing good, for at the proper time, the Kairos time, you will reap a harvest. And then God has a uh, again, as things come to a head, I'm believing that people are going to see, like Gil said, their need for Jesus Christ. Maybe it was all about the tree and all about the gifts and all about, and now it, how are we going to get together with both of our big family groups, both sides of the family? Well, we're not. So what will we do instead? Maybe worship the Lord, whose birthday it is anyways. Ever been to a birthday party and the kid that's having the birthday, it's like, is it really his birthday or are the adults just got a good excuse to get together and it's not even about the kid? Uh, amen. This is about Jesus. A time to worship him. Hallelujah. And Galatians 6.10, um, as we have opportunity, let us good, do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. As we have an opportune time, as we have a Kairos time, Let's be aware of what good we can do, maybe for our neighbors. Maybe we can't get together with our families. Maybe it'll cause us to be do something different, mix it up a little bit. Maybe there could be an incredible harvest. That's what these promises are suggesting. Amen. To make the most of that opportunity. Well, that's the Kairos timing of the Lord. I believe with all of my heart we are so in it right now. Amen. And what you do with it is your up to you and the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus.